Sometimes games are like magic, which is amazing, but also confusing. How does it all work? The amazing thing about games is that they can make you experience things that seem completely impossible in the real world. I think there's no better example for this than so-called non-Euclidean games. They seem to bend reality and it looks like they completely change the laws of nature you're familiar with in real life. Games like Antichamber, Superliminal and even Portal show what a mind-boggling experience games can deliver. They're often described as non-Euclidean, but what does that mean exactly? Let's start with your everyday Euclidean geometry. Without going too much into the math behind it, you can think of Euclidean geometry as a geometry they teach you in high school. Certain rules that apply here apply specifically to the Euclidean world, rules which likely seem completely logical to you. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, let's go over some of these rules. First, we say the shortest possible line between two points is one without curvature. You can see how introducing any curves on this line would make it longer. So, rule number one, a straight line is the shortest line between two points. Next, we say that two parallel lines are at all times the same distance from each other, no matter how far they stretch. Makes sense, right? We can stretch these lines as far as we want, but they will always be the same distance from each other. Rule number two, parallel lines are a constant distance from each other. Finally, we're going to look at triangles. In Euclidean geometry, we say that the angles in triangles always add up to exactly 180 degrees, something you might still remember from school. Rule number three, the angles in triangles always add up to 180 degrees. Keep in mind that in reality, there are actually five rules called Euclid's postulates, which describe the Euclidean world. For now, we can just focus on these few simplified rules. Now how would we recognize if we're in a world with non-Euclidean geometry? Well, we'd have to see if anything around us breaks the rules of Euclidean geometry we know of. But how is this possible? How could two parallel lines ever cross or diverge? Or how could the shortest route between two points not be a straight line? Well, luckily, the answer isn't very complex. The most important observation is that the rules of Euclidean geometry only apply to a flat world. They only work on a flat piece of paper. As soon as we bend the paper or we try and draw our examples on a sphere, our rules no longer apply. You see that the rules we set before no longer hold as soon as we introduce a curved space. For example, try connecting two points on a sphere. The shortest distance between those points is no longer a straight line. Or try looking at two parallel lines. Suddenly they start to get closer and closer together. What about our triangle rule? Well, take a look at this. Suppose we take a ball and we wrap an elastic band around it, north pole to south pole. Now take another elastic band and wrap it around the equator of the ball, with a 90 degree angle to the first one. Finally, take a third elastic band and wrap it around the ball in such a way that it's orthogonal to both elastic bands, like so. The way we've done it, all rubber bands make angles of 90 degrees with each other. However, if we look at one of the triangles we formed, we can see that we make three 90 degree turns to form a single triangle. This means the angles of our triangle now add up to 270 degrees, instead of the 180 degrees we had in Euclidean space. Generally, when we're talking about non-Euclidean geometries, we're talking about such curved spaces. Two possibilities are usually mentioned, hyperbolic and spherical space. In hyperbolic space, parallel lines diverge like we're drawing on a saddle shape. And in spherical space, they get closer together, like when we're drawing on a sphere. A fantastic visual example for what hyperbolic and spherical spaces might look like are these great visualizations by Twitter user Xenorogue. For instance, take a look at these snowballs in hyperbolic space. Notice how all the parallax we had in Euclidean space is gone. Everything seems to come at us at the same speed regardless of distance. And what about spherical space? This seems even weirder, where snowballs that are behind us look like they're in front of us again, and everything seems to be moving back and forth. Cool. For another fantastic explanation and visualization of non-Euclidean geometry, check out this devlog of Hyperbolica. Phew! Well, as you can see, things can become pretty trippy in non-Euclidean worlds. 
So, what would non-Euclidean worlds look like in games? One of the best examples I found was this non-Euclidean world demo, where space is compressed and expanded based on the player's position. To achieve this, the demo uses a technique called ray tracing, which is a subject for another video. But the basic principle is that you're shooting rays from the camera, which simulate the way that light rays hit your eyes. This means that you can build the environment around you completely using the rays you shoot from the camera. Now imagine that you can stretch or compress the length of these rays at will, and because the rendering of the world is completely dependent on these rays, suddenly you can stretch and compress the world itself. If you then assign specific parts of your world to have different effects on your rays, you can see how you would achieve these strange non-Euclidean effects, where the space around you is morphed. Another great, more recent example I mentioned earlier is Hyperbolica. It shows you exactly what it would be like walking around in different kinds of non-Euclidean worlds, and is the best example of a non-Euclidean game I could find to date. To find out how that works, it's best to go to their YouTube channel. They have some great devlogs explaining the inner workings of their game as well as the theory behind it. But most games you see with seemingly non-Euclidean behavior achieve their effects in a different way relying much more on clever tricks and a lot of smoke and mirrors to create the effect of impossible worlds in traditional game engines. But that is precisely why game development is so interesting. So let's take a deeper look at two popular non-Euclidean games and uncover their secrets. The first example most people think of when mentioning non-Euclidean games is Antichamber. That's not surprising, as the entire game is built around mind-bending and counterintuitive puzzles, some of which even seem to defy the logic of space itself. Well, it's time to lift a bit of the curtain and see how it's done. We'll start with the stairs illusion. The puzzle goes like this. You see two sets of stairs, red and blue. You pick one of them, you walk down, turn a corner and you see the same set of stairs. Okay, so this time you think you got it and you pick the other staircase. You walk down, turn a corner and same thing. How do we solve it? Well, you pick neither staircase and you just walk back where you came from. And the puzzle is solved. I can tell you the first time I encountered this my mind was blown. How does this work? How do rooms infinitely repeat and how did it do it so seamlessly? If you're having similar questions then you're in luck because they're all about to be answered. The way the hallways are constructed gives something away about how the illusion works. You have one room with the two sets of stairs and you have the hallway leading up to the stairs you're supposed to go back into. Both have two corners with a stretch of identical white hallway. You see, what actually happens is that when you turn a corner and walk far enough, you are simply teleported to the identical looking hallway leading up to the stairs. And because of the flat lighting of antechamber, there's no way to tell when the teleport happens. So to you, it seems completely smooth. However, we can trick the game a bit into giving away its secrets. You see, we can take a cube with us to break the illusion of the identical hallways. And now when we walk through the hallway, we can see the exact moment we're teleported. Such teleporting tricks are riddled throughout the game. Sometimes with parts of the wall you need to focus on, and sometimes they're combined with a window you can see through. To see how that is done, you can watch my video on how portals work, because a similar technique is used here. As you can see, a lot can be done by cleverly teleporting a player and copy-pasting rooms to give the illusion of a non-Euclidean world. Another mind-blowing trick to me was this impossible cube in the museum. On every side you see a completely different scene, but how is that possible? It looks like multiple scenes exist in the same space. Well, the trick is very simple, but it does require some knowledge beforehand. You see, the graphics card in your computer gives us a little buffer which can mask and discard pixels on our screen. Usually, this buffer is used to mask out parts of our screen with stencils. Therefore, this buffer is called the stencil buffer. What can we use it for? Well, think for example of rendering a rear view mirror in a game. You don't want to draw the entire rear view of the car on top of the frontal view. You just want to draw it in this tiny rectangular mirror. For this, we can define a stencil. Using that, the rear view will only be rendered in parts that overlap with the stencil. Pretty handy. But 
game developers always like to abuse the tools they're provided with, which is how this illusion was created. You see, the stencil buffer can have multiple channels. To illustrate, let's say we have a red channel, a blue channel and a green channel. A stencil assigned to the red channel will only render objects assigned to that same red channel. So if we look through a panel with that stencil buffer, we'll only be able to see objects in the red channel. Alright, now we create two more of these panels, one for blue and one for the green channel. And if we stick these panels around a cube and place our objects inside, we can see the illusion unfold. Multiple rooms within the same space. Wow, it's like magic. Another game that blew people's minds was Super Liminal, especially their forced perspective mechanic. The idea is that you pick up objects, and while their perspective size remains the same, their real size changes dramatically. So, objects that appear really big really are that big in the game world. Pretty cool. So how does it work? Well, this has everything to do with the angular diameter. Or in other words, the apparent size of an object in your view. The trick is to keep this angular diameter the same regardless of the distance to an object. So how does it work? Well, if we look at the formula, we can see the angular diameter is determined by two variables. Diameter and distance. The way to keep an object the same apparent size while its distance changes is really simple. The scale of an object always scales together with its distance to us. So if the distance is twice as far, we just make the scale twice as big. And if the distance is halved, then make the scale half the size. This ensures our object always stays the same size in our field of view. Now, the way we get our forced perspective effect is like this. As soon as we pick up an object, remember the distance and scale somewhere. Now, when we move the object around, we simply push the object we're holding as far against the wall as possible, while keeping its apparent size the same. If we remember the starting size and distance, all we need to do now is check how far the object is and compare that to our starting distance. The ratio between the current distance and the starting distance is how much we should scale our object. And voila! We have our mind-boggling forced perspective mechanic. Now are these games really non-Euclidean? Well, yes and no. On the one hand, you only need to break one of the Euclidean rules to be considered non-Euclidean. But on the other hand, they have little to do with real non-Euclidean geometry. Their effects are all achieved with deceit and trickery. But, in the end, aren't all games like that? I think they still give you the same sense of amazement and confusion as real non-Euclidean geometry, with just some clever applications of a few simple tricks. And in the end, that's what I like most about it. The simplicity of it. The programming behind it is based on some pretty simple principles, and yet developers manage to create these mind-blowing experiences with it. To me, that is the most beautiful thing about game development. It's almost like magic. You don't have to be incredibly smart or talented to be able to create these wonderful things. Sometimes all it takes is some creativity, some insight or a flare of inspiration to craft something that will blow people away. And I strongly believe that can happen to anyone. All you need is a love to create and a passion to learn. So keep creating and keep learning everyone. And if you've come this far, you can at least say that you're already a bit wiser.